The patient decontamination process is a course designed to demonstrate methods for the actual cleaning of patients in the various modes of presentation. It is intended to instruct decon team members who will function as the operations team in an emergency decontamination operation, or EDO. While your hospital's equipment may vary, most of the concepts taught here will apply. There are three ways that patients move through the decontamination process. These are walking or ambulatory, seated or semi-ambulatory, and lying on a backboard or non-ambulatory. Each mode of presentation requires a slightly different configuration of the decon corridor. The corridor may also be reconfigured several times throughout the emergency decontamination operation, depending on the number of patients, their mode of presentation, and the arrival intervals associated with this event. These three presentation modes also impact the amount of contact the operation team has with the patient and the techniques the team uses in the decon process. Walking patients usually require only minimal assistance. The decon unit leader issues instructions to the patient, as most people are familiar with washing themselves. Instructions include telling them to wash from head to feet and to never wash anything back up into their face. The operations team's role here may require nothing more than observing and being ready in case of an emergency. A member of the operations team hands the patient a towel to dry off with and wraps them in a gown or blanket after the decontamination process. Once the patient exits into the hospital post-decontamination zone, they can be handled like a normal patient. Semi-ambulatory patients require a chair to be added to the decon corridor during initial setup or added after these patients enter the shower system. These types of patients require a greater degree of assistance. Once the patient is seated, the operations team works from opposite sides of the patient. One team member wets and rinses the patient with a handheld sprayer, while the other washes the accessible areas. Wash from head to feet and never wash anything back into the face. The sprayer should be set for a high-volume, low-pressure spray. A hand cupped over the sprayer helps to diffuse the flow, so splashes are minimized. This practice avoids recontamination of previously cleaned areas. After washing all accessible areas, the patient is leaned forward carefully so the operations team can wash and rinse the patient's back. After this is complete, the operations team helps the patient to a standing position so they can wash and rinse the buttocks and upper legs. A full rinse of all affected areas completes the patient washing process. It is a good idea to rinse off the chair at this point in case the patient needs to suddenly sit back down. The operations team then works in unison to assist the patient to exit out of the decontamination corridor and provides them with a towel for drying and a blanket, gown, and foot coverings for comfort. Once complete, they can be transported by wheelchair into the emergency department. A non-ambulatory patient presents the greatest challenge for the operations team. The patient is usually delivered to the entry point of the hospital decontamination zone by EMS or perhaps by private vehicle. Decon team members first make sure the patient's clothing has been removed using trauma shears routinely dipped in a bleach solution to help minimize transfer of contaminant from one area to another. The patient can then be placed on a backboard and then moved into the decontamination corridor. Their head should be at the uphill end of sloped areas to prevent water flowing into the face. The backboard can be used to aid patient transfers and packages them for stability during movement. If needed, the person who brought the patient to the hospital may be called upon to assist the operations team in lifting them into the decontamination corridor. These assisting individuals should then be decontaminated themselves. If the patient does not require C-spine immobilization during the decontamination process, washing them is very similar to the semi-ambulatory patient. Your exact procedures may differ somewhat, but routinely one team member wets and rinses the patient with a handheld sprayer, while the other washes them from head to feet using soap and a soft scrub brush. The sprayer should be set for a high-volume, low-pressure spray. 
A hand cupped over the sprayer helps to diffuse the flow, so splashes are minimized. This practice avoids recontamination of previously cleaned areas. If the patient requires C-spine stabilization, one operations team member constantly monitors the head while additional team members do all the cleaning. There may be a need to add an additional clinician in PPE to the operations team in order to constantly assess the patient if their condition warrants. After washing all accessible areas, use a log rolling technique to access the back. From one side of the patient, one operations team member will place the patient's opposite arm over their chest and the near arm placed up alongside their head. The operations team member then leans over and rolls the patient toward themselves. The other team member scrubs and rinses the patient's backside. The process is repeated from the other side. A full rinse of all affected areas and the backboard completes the washing process. The patient is then taken to the cold end of the decontamination corridor by the operations team, placed upon a hospital gurney, and moved into the emergency department. Any patient care equipment used during decontamination should stay within the decontamination corridor. If the patient has received traumatic injury, other procedures may apply. Wash lacerations or abrasions first. Remove field dressings and thoroughly wash the site to dilute or remove any substance from the wound. After this initial washing, the wound can be dressed with water-occlusive dressing that is held in place by direct pressure. While decontaminating the remainder of the victim, take care not to wash contaminants back into the wound. Once the victim is completely decontaminated, Reevaluate the wound site and clean again if necessary. Limb fractures may require another special procedure. Splinting devices applied by pre hospital responders should not be removed until the patient is completely decontaminated. Once all areas of the patient are thoroughly cleaned, remove the splinting device and address the limb. If the splint is removed before decontamination is completed, the limb may become unstable and cause the patient unneeded stress and pain. Operations team members should practice various medical procedures while dressed in PPE. This enables them to realize limitations and also build confidence that they can provide needed assistance if necessary within the hospital decontamination zone. It is better to practice this skill than take shortcuts in the decontamination process in order to get the patient into the emergency department, potentially causing secondary exposures to unprotected emergency department personnel. The various presentations decontamination corridor of victims requiring decontamination create different challenges for the operations team. Ambulatory and semi-ambulatory patients are allowed to wash themselves when they are able. Sometimes the operations team must assist them or even do all of the washing. The techniques presented here make this procedure easier, but they must be well practiced in realistic drills for your team to become truly proficient at safe and effective decontamination. The next task is to assemble all components of the decontamination system following manufacturer's instructions. Be certain to place all utilities, such as hoses and extension cords, on the dirty side of the corridor. Place a soap dispenser and brushes within easy reach of the patient. The soap should be liquid, non-abrasive, and without any perfumes or additives. The brush should have a long handle so the patient can reach all body areas, and the bristles should be soft to prevent irritating or damaging the skin. Systems should be in place to dry and provide privacy to victims exiting decon at the cold end. There should be buckets with a sanitizing product in them and trauma shears in case clothing needs to be cut off of non-ambulatory patients. You should test the equipment after it is fully assembled. Turn the water on to make sure that sufficient pressure and flow are available and to ensure that all shower heads are correctly aimed and working properly. Also, make certain temperature is adjusted to provide warm water whenever possible. 
This water does not need to be pumped into the wastewater collection container. Place a wastewater pump, whether electric or manual, in the collection pool at the lowest point on the dirty side of the decon corridor. This pump is used to evacuate contaminated water into a wastewater collection container. If an electric pump is used, its electric cord should enter on the dirty side to avoid creating a trip hazard. Anytime you use electricity around water, safety precautions such as using GFCI outlets must be met. Steps such as turning the water off between victims can be taken to minimize the amount of clean water that is pumped into the wastewater collection containers. Place solid waste collection containers along the dirty side to collect refuse. Position container number one so the patient can deposit their contaminated clothing and any gowns they use to cover them prior to decontamination. Collect all the dirty towels and other items used during the decontamination process in container number two. Use container number three to collect the decon team's disposable personal protective equipment. These containers should be closable to suppress the release of any vapors. Use as many containers as necessary, but try to keep them on the dirty side of the decon corridor. When the decon corridor is established in this order, it is possible to evacuate all unprotected personnel and allow patients to enter the shower before the corridor is completely assembled. Designated decon team members wearing protective gear can add pumps and solid waste collection containers later. Once the decon corridor has been readied, equipment support monitors all utilities and stands by to assist the decon unit leader as needed. Many times utilities are regulated remotely. For example, water can be turned on and off at the spigot and pumps can be turned on and off at the outlet. At the conclusion of decontamination, turn off all utilities. This may be done by protected personnel in the decon corridor or remotely by equipment support. A shower chair may be added for semi-ambulatory patients who are unable to stand unassisted throughout the showering process. Position the chair so that the patient can enter and exit the system safely and the operations team has access on two sides. The patient should ideally be within easy reach of a handheld sprayer, soap, and brush or sponge. Having a walker available can also be useful for patients with mobility problems or to hold on to as they raise their feet to ensure the bottoms of their feet are decontaminated as well. Non-ambulatory patients should be secured on a backboard, stretcher, or other device to aid movement through the decontamination process. In this case, the shower can be set aside until the supine patient is decontaminated inside the collection pool. After the patient is removed from the system, the shower can be replaced in the pool for ambulatory victims or for operations team members conducting self-decontamination. With some types of portable equipment, multiple corridors can be established. If resources are available, these corridors can be mixed and matched to care for ambulatory, semi-ambulatory, and non-ambulatory patients. The same principles of setting up the decon corridor still apply. Utilities and supplies should still be concentrated on the dirty side, and victims will still proceed through the process from the warm end to the cold end. If a decon tent is used, position it on the tarp in a very similar manner to a portable decon shower. The entrance to the tent should open toward the warm end of the decon corridor and exit toward the cold end of the corridor. All utilities should be concentrated on the dirty side. Many decon tents offer independent corridors allowing the simultaneous management of both ambulatory and non-ambulatory victims. The non-ambulatory patient can be placed on a backboard and rolled through the shower using a portable litter conveyor system or series of portable sawhorses. Position collection containers for solid and liquid waste so that a safe and unobstructed work area still exists for those team members in the highest level of personal protective equipment.
Performing decontamination in a fixed facility offers some advantages over portable equipment when it comes to preparation time, but several steps need to be taken before introducing patients into the system. Clear the room of all non-essential equipment, turn on the showers, and adjust the water temperature. Appropriately place solid waste collection containers throughout the area. Turn on the air venting system and test it for function. The decon corridor principle of demarcating a warm and cold end still applies to fixed facilities with one exception. In a facility with a single door, patients and the operations team should enter along one side of the door, the warm side, and exit along the other, the clean side. For semi-ambulatory patients, a chair can be placed in the system. Place brushes and soap in close proximity to the chair. For non-ambulatory patients, place soap and brushes so the operations team has easy access. Gather clean equipment such as backboards, gurneys, cervical collars, and towels and place them outside the decon room near the exit door. Practice decon area setup along with all decontamination skills. The principles behind setting up your decon area and appropriate zones are applicable regardless of the nature of the event, the equipment type, or the number of victims and responding personnel. Keep in mind the critical need to maintain clear separation between the hospital decontamination zone and the hospital post-decontamination zone so that decontamination is as safe and efficient as possible.